All right, so good evening, everybody. Um, again, my name is Dr. Stephanie Lampkin, and I'm the director of the Jane Littleton Mitchell Center for African American Heritage here at the Delaware Historical Society. And just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, we ask that you just mute your microphone. If you are not speaking, there'll be an opportunity for you to engage with both um, of our speakers during the course of the program. Um, but um, we just ask just to avoid any background noise or difficulty with hearing any of the presentation that you just keep your microphone muted um, when you're not speaking. Um, and during the course of the presentation, if you do have any questions, uh, we encourage you to just put them in the chat and we will do our best to try to address those questions as they come in. Uh, to get started, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement statement um, that we at the Delaware Historical Society have used, um, which was crafted uh, with the help of Chief Dennis Coker. Um, so we begin by acknowledging with respect we gather today in Lenape Hoking, traditional homeland of the Lenape people for tens of thousands of years. Sometimes translated as original people, the Lenape were known as mediators and called the grandfathers by the entire Algonquin family tree of languages. Um, within the first hundred years of foreign contact, 80% of the Lenape had already died from uh, violent conflict and disease. In spite of the famous peace treaty between William Penn and the Lenape chief Tumanen, um, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, but the Lenape never left. Hiding in plain sight as keepers of the land, the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware, based in Cheswell, Delaware, uh, the Nanakoke Lenai Lenape Tribal Nation in Bridgeton, New Jersey, and the Ramapo Lenape Nation in Mawa, New Jersey, are three of the thriving Lenape communities today. So let us acknowledge the historical and ongoing presence of the Lenape and the Nanakoke on this land where we now live, work, and celebrate all our relations. Um, so thank you for your, your patience with that. I see a couple more people are trickling into the room. So I was a little distracted there as I'm trying to get everybody in to start the, <laughs> to start the program. Um, but I am very pleased to introduce our two speakers this evening. Um, I will start by introducing uh, Molly Collins. Molly Collins is an NEH Next Generation Fellow in the African American Public Humanities and a PhD candidate in English Studies at the University of Delaware. And in fact, she's set to defend her dissertation on Friday. So if everybody can just send good vibes and well wishes, we wish her the best as she does it. And thank her for her attendance this evening, knowing that she has a dissertation defense on Friday. Uh, her dissertation offers a Black feminist critique of archival theory in its examination of contemporary Black women's literary and visual art documenting mother-child separation as a result of state-sanctioned violence. Her dissertation project has won the Ida B. Wells Award from the Coordinating Council for Women in History, and its third chapter won an essay award from the National Women's Studies Association. Her public humanities practice includes providing doula services to Black families in the DMV area. I'm also very pleased to introduce uh, Kelly Coles, um, who is here as our speaker, um, as well as their work, um, I find, intersect and speak to each other very well. Kelly Coles is a PhD candidate in the History Department at the University of Delaware. She is an African American Public Humanities Initiative Fellow and Colored Conventions Project Scholar and Co-Chair of the Website and Digital Exhibits Committee. Ooh. By looking at everyday objects and domestic spaces, Kelly explores what more we can learn about the lived experiences and influences of Black Americans during the 1700s and 1800s as they fought to be acknowledged as American citizens worthy of equal rights. 
Her dissertation excavates the presence of creativity of Black American girls who were creating needlework in early America to better understand how Black communities maneuvered in their transitions from enslavement to freedom. Kelly finds joy in practicing yoga and is planning to teach herself how to embroider in the coming months. So it's just great to know because we might wanna invite her back <laughs> for another activity. Um, so I wanna thank both of our speakers for joining us this evening. And as we dive into this, what I know is going to be an excellent presentation, I do wanna take a moment to talk a little bit about the Mosley Doll Collection here at the Delaware Historical Society that's going to be highlighted in this presentation. Um, even though we are currently closed to the public, uh, the Mitchell Center for African American Heritage continues to provide virtual programs. And you can also view our exhibition a video online through the Delaware Historical Society YouTube page. Within our exhibition, Journey to Freedom at the Delaware History Museum, uh, there is a section that's dedicated to the Mosley Dog Collection. Um, African-American children growing up in the 1950s saw few dolls that looked like them. But after Brenda Mosley saw Black actors in films, she wanted to see more positive images of African-American people. Throughout her childhood and beyond, Ms. Mosley says she was always on the lookout for books and movies on television with Black faces. A lifelong collector, Brenda Mosley developed a museum at her home in Newark, Delaware, that featured more than 3,000 dolls. Her collection celebrates the accomplishments of famous and everyday African-American women, uh, men, women, and communities from slavery through the Harlem Renaissance, the battle for civil rights, into the present. Um, and I'm just going to read here a quote from uh, Brenda Mosley regarding the collection. Quote, as a doll collector, I fell in love with African-American dolls because they reflect my history and culture, end quote. So we hope that you'll enjoy seeing some of the images of specific dolls that are housed with the Delaware Historical Society collection throughout this presentation. Um, and with that, I will now turn it over to um, our guest speakers. Um, to hear this great presentation, Black Girlhood and Motherhood Studies in the DHS Mosley Dog Collection. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you all for being here today with us um, to speak about our projects and the Mosley Dog Collection. Before we got started, we thought it would be a good idea to begin with a brief discussion and invitation for anyone who desires to share with the group what you think Black girlhood and Black motherhood studies means and encompasses. So to get started, I'll begin with the question. What do you think when you hear Black girlhood studies? And feel free to unmute yourself to share with the group. What is Black girlhood studies? And who and what does it center? And who does it not center? Any thoughts? You all can just go right ahead and unmute yourselves. No need to raise your hand, but thank you. Can you guys hear me? Your voice sounds muffled. Can you hear me now? No. So unfortunately, your audio is not coming through. So if you are able to just Does anyone else want to take a stab at what they think black girl black girlhood studies is and who and what it encompasses and who it does not encompass? I think it might include the objects girls played with, uh, black girls played with as youngsters, uh, as well as some of the games. Yes. Perhaps it includes um, repeating mother wit to things women around them told them or um, 
I'm thinking of Jamaica Kincaid's piece uh, on girl, some of the things that they learned early on the, how they should interact with uh, the world around them. Yes, exactly, exactly. It, it is an interdisciplinary work that centers black girls, their lives and their experiences inside and outside of academia. Um, black girlhood studies can be traced back to the 20th century with studies centering black girls such as Joyce Ladner's Tomorrow's Tomorrow or Bell Hook's memoir, Bone Black, or as was mentioned, Jamaica Kincaid's book. And it comes out of the formation of black studies departments and the centering of black women in history. It was not until the 21st century, however, that we began to see a plethora of scholarships such as Ruth Nicole Brown's celebratory work and book, Black Girlhood Celebration, and Kira Gantz, The Games That Black Girls Play, that came along um, and really showed us what Black girls have been doing in their lives and celebrating them. We also had the founding of the History of Black Girlhood Academic Network in 2015, the Black Girlhood Project and Reading List by Dr. Sandra Bickham in 2018, and many other conferences, the Global History of Black Girlhood Conference, for instance, and the Childhoods of Color Conference in the past decade, where we have really begun to see a substantial amount of scholarship, free creative works, museums, films, social programs, reports, and other things that center Black girls' ex experiences around race, gender, sexuality, skin color, social economic status, amongst a, host, amongst a host of other intersections present in our world. And what I have found um, to be two very informative pieces were and are towards an inter disciplinary field of Black girl, Girlhood Studies, which is a 2017 article in Departures from Critical Qualitative Research, and Dr. Crystal Lynn Webster's Organization of American Historian 2020 article about Black Girlhood and Black Girlhood Studies. And we will have these both linked at the end of our presentation for you to um, look at further in your own time. And now I will turn it over to Molly to discuss Black Girlhood Studies, Black Motherhood Studies with you as well. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so we're just going to do a similar exercise, right? So feel free to unmute yourself and participate. What do you think of when you think of Black Motherhood Studies? Or I put it another way, what do you think of when you think of Black motherhood? Can anyone name anything about Black motherhood that they've heard about as bad or pejorative of Black mothers? That unfortunately might be an easier question. So I will um, say, and, and I apologize if my audio is a little, um, uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, I think Black motherhood historically, um, you know, when I think to things like the Underground Railroad and child rearing and the relationship between mothers and daughters, um, you know, I, I feel like it's one that you have to fight to maintain. It's like, you know, I, I feel like that's something that um, is really central to the Black experience is motherhood, but at the same time, it's, I feel like, I feel like it comes with a lot of, um, you know, you're, you're really carrying a lot of weight as somebody who is a Black mother. Absolutely. Um, so I have here, and this is just kind of like a more academic definition, right? But simply put, the study of Black motherhood 
um, is a study of experience, right? So something that one feels about motherhood or their experience of being a Black mother, um, as well as embodiment, right? What it feels to be seen as a Black mother or have their body read as a Black mother. Someone, um, or the study of Black motherhood as a social location. So thinking about how Black mothers uh, so lots of sociologists think of Black motherhood in terms of a social location. So how, uh, what the socioeconomic status of most Black women are. How do Black women vote? How do Black mothers vote? Um, also, Black motherhood as an institution, right? So uh, usually in 19th and early 20th century texts, we, come to, we have come to really know motherhood as something that um, originates from a white Victorian um, idea of what mothers are, right? Or someone who cares, um, acts a particular way and um, is delicate with their children. But we have a study of black motherhood studies, especially today, and especially for in the last almost 30 years, since 1990, um, with uh, the, the work of sociologist uh, Patricia Hill Collins, who writes about black motherhood as um, a paradigm through which we can really understand history with a big H. So the evolution of thought and memory, the evolution um, of our country, of, of the African diaspora, um, or of global politics, but also how we think about history in a little H, right? So think about our own individual experiences with memory um, and uh, with Black mothers as a paradigm to really understand a different way of seeing the world, right? And so Kelly and I were really excited to talk about Black girlhood and Black motherhood together, especially within the context of the Mosley doll collection, because we think these dolls really help illuminate um, as material objects um, and, and as things that are ephemera, right? Or objects that were perhaps originally meant to just serve a single purpose, right? So maybe just a child to play with them. but um, they, they're not single use objects, right? Um, they, are, they can be something that can glean information about um, our, our history, right? In its entirety or even historical moments. So uh, the dolls that we've selected to kind of do close readings of today with you all, um, we will tie into other historical moments and movements happening at the time and to kind of pull out some themes um, through which uh, Brenda Mosley kind of curated for us to to witness and to understand through her doll collection. Um, before we start that, I just, Kelly and I are going to do a little brief overview of our projects to kind of tie in why, why, this, why the Mosley collection um, is kind of important to us and also how we think it could kind of shift the way that we're about to, to read the objects of the dolls together. So I'm going to start by um, just talking about my dissertation. Um, as Dr. Lamkin said, it's um, it's entitled to learn to let them go. Uh, I have to look at the slide to read the own title, my title of my own dissertation. Um, it's Black Feminist Archiving and the Creative Revivals of Black Motherhood. And it's a Black feminist project that really attends to the gaps of scholarship uh, that's, that's laid bare by the idea of archival studies, which has rarely taken up Black mothers, right? So often when we think of Black mothers historically, since enslavement, Black mothers are often uh, appear to us in the archives as um, people who are unfortunately breeders of property, right? Um, people who are not mothers, meaning they don't give care, but they are simply there to rear children or sometimes be wet nurses for other people's children. And if you read a lot of say, um, bills of sale, right? Black women who have children are rendered just like that, just as I said. Black woman or a Negro woman with child. Rarely is this kind of relationship of motherhood actually written in archives, right? Um, and so my work really looks at contemporary uh, literary and visual and material arts practices that are really interested, um, that they're interested in documenting a different history of Black motherhood. Now, that doesn't always mean that they're looking at the sunshine and roses uh, aspects of Black motherhood, trying to save Black mothers from their sordid past of being enslaved or being indentured servants, right? But instead, they're just interested in telling multiple stories about who Black mothers are, right? And kind of relieving us of this idea that Black mothers are just one type of person. 
And so in my dissertation, I read uh, objects and texts that you probably have either read in high school or books that you could easily access at the library or probably even things that you've seen at um, a museum, right? So I'm thinking things like uh, books by Toni Morrison, um, by Toni K. Gambara, and even sculptures by um, a Black woman artist named Elizabeth Catlett, which you can see here um, on the, the slide, um, that really helped me think about how Black women document their relationships with their children every day, but also their relationship with the idea that Black women are often separated from their children. If it's not through um, in chattel slavery, through a child being sold away from them. In our present day, we have um, kind of rhetorical connections being made between Black women and their children being separated by things such as police brutality, right? Or mass incarceration. So I wanted to start with a little anecdote um, about mothers and Black mothers um, in terms of thinking about Black motherhood um, as, a, a, again, a social position, right, or an experience of Black women that's really been under threat for almost the entirety of our existence within America. So I don't know if you've all heard of a book called um, Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, which is by Dorothy Roberts. But in this text, um, we meet a woman named Ida Hutchinson, right? And it's in her first, uh, Dorothy Roberts' first chapter. And she writes about Ida, um, and I'll just excerpt right here what she says, right? She says that Ida Hutchinson was a woman uh, on a plantation in the American South. And Ida had recently given birth to a child. And she was with a small cadre of caregivers who, were, who also had recently given birth to children and then we're forced back into the field shortly after giving birth, okay? So we know that often children were sold away sometimes before birth, or I'm excuse me, directly after birth, but these women were allowed to, attend, to keep their children and attend to their nurslings throughout the day. She and her contemporaries then, they dug a shallow ditch on the edge of the field so that they could nurse their children when they heard them cry, right? They weren't allowed to wear them on their body, so they just dug a ditch so that they could hear them. A thunderous storm came and rain filled the ditch and each infant drowned before their mothers were able to reach them. And Dorothy Roberts writes that Ida Hutchinson understood that the deaths of the babies were meant, meant a financial loss to the slave master. But no one recorded the horror that these mothers felt upon uh, discovering their precious babies lifeless in their cradle. Ida's story relates the unique archival erasure endured by Black mothers in America, starting with the fraught history of enslavement and throughout the vastly unequal treatment that Black mothers have received from the modern child welfare and criminal justice systems. Black women artists like Elizabeth Catlett, again, as you see here, have picked up on this idea of the lack of recording, right, um, of such structural overdetermination, right, or the idea that Black women are always subjected to these systems of control, and that these systems are actually in charge of their relationships with their children instead of us, right? And I find that sculptures like these that we see here, right, um, really tell us the stories about how women also understand that their relationship with their children seems to be out of their own control. And Elizabeth Catlett herself said one time that, you know, when she became, when she became a sculptor at Howard University, she always sculpted her pieces out of the same piece of wood or the same piece of metal. But as she got older and as she got uh, wiser, she started to carve the pieces of mothers and children out of two pieces, two different pieces of material, because she found that, quote, children must always learn to leave their mothers, and more importantly, that mothers must learn to let them go, end quote. So I find that, you know, these works right here really help us undo rigid definitions of what documentation is, what recording is, because what Slave, uh, enslavers wrote for us in bills of sale or um, in inventory logs, they, they show us that Black mothers were producers of property or that they were negligent or bad mothers um, or even a stain on the conventional notions of, of womanhood. But when we have work like this, right, that really shows us what it means to 
record something different than a monetary loss, right? We can really see that it's Black women's art production it, that is a new radical form of archival labor. And it's, it's this form of uh, radical um, archival labor that helps us record the generations of horror that's really produced from losing a child. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Kelly so she can talk about her dissertation project a little bit. Thank you, Molly. Um, my dissertation project centers Black girls and the needlework they created in early America to better understand what it was like to grow up as Black and girl during the formation of the United States. And as Molly talked about, unfortunately, Black girls and mothers rarely appear in the archives of early America. Sadia Hartman explains that this absence of archival evidence centering Black girls and women as the violence of the archives, wherein the voices and bodies of Black girls and women are silenced, commodified, insulted, and defamed in archival records, predominantly written from the perspective and gaze of white men. And due to the same actions of white supremacy, historian Darlene Clark Hine speaks about how Black girls and women will also decide to sometimes remain silent to protect themselves and to protect their subjectivities. However, Black girls and women did create. As Alice Walker speaks about in her text, In Search of Our Mother's Garden, a girl or a woman cre creates to feed her soul and to order the universe in her personal concept of beauty. Therefore, I argue if we center Black girls and the mater material culture that they created, we come away with an even more nuanced understanding of Black girls and how their communities transition from enslavement to various forms of freedom in the U.S. Hence, my work is also grounded in Black feminist womenist theor theories and methodologies that also marry his historical met methods of centering the archives with material and visual culture analysis. The needlework that I begin with in my research are samplers and embroidery stitched by Black schoolgirls beginning in the late 18th century and throughout the 19th century. These are rare pieces that can reveal the names of their makers, their ages, their educational institutions and or their teachers, the names of their family members. They may feature literary or biblical verses, the alphabet, numbers, as well as decorative motifs such as birds, flowers, baskets, fruit, buildings, and bodies of water. And I also examine quilts and clothing created by Black girls and women, which builds on the needlework skills learned and exhibited in the schoolgirl samplers and embroideries. And here I have featured the family record sampler by Sarah Ann Major Harris, um, a wig rose quilt, border quilt made by we believe two enslaved sisters on a Kentucky plantation and a dress stitched by an unidentified enslaved woman or women. So as I began to think about my work and its intersection with the Mosley doll collection, I perused the collection and one of the first dolls that caught my eye was this one. She is an African-American plastic female doll made with straight limbs that swivel at the body and sleeping eyes. She stands 30 inches tall and was made in 1994 by the Lovey Doll and Toy Company. I was drawn to her attire, that curvilinear white embroidery featured on the front of the caftan around the neck and down the middle and on the cuff of the wide sleeves. The fabric of the caftan appears appears to possibly be printed white curved brush strokes all over a green field color. The girl doll is donning a headband in the same fabric, which is holding her white beaded braids off of her face. The description says the attire, the attire is a vaguely West African style. Looking at this doll, I questioned why it was made and dressed in this particular attire and what could the creation of this doll and its attire have been doing for the creator, as well as for us now looking at it? 
It brought to mind the pride many Black Americans have in our culture and history and learn themselves to teach their children because it is not taught in schools. It brings to mind the linkages many of us make to known and unknown ancestors and their African homelands. It is a link that I create in my own research because contra contrary to some people's beliefs, needlework was not a new skill introduced to enslaved Black people when they were brought to the Americas. For example, the, ne the needlework scholarship of, of American girlhood samplers and embroideries have often overlooked the possible contribution of African needlework and textile production traditions besides the beautiful works produced in the northern country of Egypt. However, scholars of African textile history have identified needlework practiced in many African societies over many centuries. Specifically, there is a long history of embroidery and textile production in West Africa. Art histor historian Victor Victoria L. Ravine notes that embroidery is a central element of dress practices in West Africa, socially elevating garments both visually and symbolically. Embroidered clothing revealed a person's religious practice and social identity, locating them in a global trade network. Broadly speaking, West African embroidery is often attributed to the spread of Islam in the 10th century because of the use of plant-like motifs, arabesque designs, and calligraphy. But these skills were also likely native to West African people and influenced by trading amongst other African, Arabian, Turkish, Jewish, European, Islamic, and Christian peoples. Textile production and embroidery expertise traveled across the Atlantic with people forcibly enslaved in the Americas. Needlework knowledge was likely brought with ancestors, grandparents, parents, or possibly some of the girls that I am studying themselves across the Atlantic from their African home villages and tribes and passed down through the generations. Free and enslaved people exhibited this knowledge, their knowledge of textile production and needlework through the work they performed throughout the Amer Americas during the antebellum era. Karen Ham Hampton argues that the su Southern textile industry would not have been possible without the skilled free and enslaved black women and girls who became what she called female textile artisans. Women and girls worked cotton and indigo fields and plantation spinning rooms loom houses, and textile mills. Hampton notes that at Monticello's Mulberry Row, female and slave girls began learning in the spinning rooms and loom houses at the tender age of 10 years old. This work was an aspect of their Black girlhoods. Needlework knowledge would have also been exhibited in the ability to mark household items to distinguish one's personal property from another's on wash days at home, in the home of one's enslaver, one's employer, or one's client. Seamstress, dressmaker, laundress, and washerwoman were, were some of the many some of the main occupations black men women were able to perform in the 18th and 19th centuries. These needlework skills would have likely been learned at home as children, exhibited through the creation of homemade dolls, such as the ones featured in the mostly collection to which Molly will speak more about. And if the girls had the opportunity to attend schools, these needlework skills would have been honed under the direction of their needlework teachers and exhibited in the form of needlework samplers and embroideries, such as this one stitched by Mary Emmiston and dated April 5th, 1803. Next slide. Mary Emmiston was a schoolgirl at the New York African Free School when she completed this 11 inch by 16 and three quarter inch silk cross stitch on plain weave linen foundation sampler. The perimeter of the sam sampler is completed with a vine of strawberries along with six more filling an empty space besides the words of the verse. Below the verse is a decorative line of stitching separating the verse from the signature line that includes the name of the school, the month, day, year, and the schoolgirl's name. Unfortunately, I have been unable to find Mary Emmiston or her parents in census records, vital records for the city, 
or the New, New York Manumission Society records as of today. I have also been unable to find the source of the verse on her sampler, but I wanted to take a moment to read it. In Christ Jesus, there is neither bond nor free that he came to let the oppressed go and to break every yoke. All who fear God and work righteousness of whatever nation or clime shall be accepted, accepted of him. May God reward the benefactors and forgive the enemies of Africa's children. Many daughters have done virtuously, but may we, remembering our peculiar obligations, excel them all. Blessed be the grace when move the feeling heart to plead the cause of man and break his chains. Blessed be the man who taught the heavenly art to banish slavery's bonds from freedom's plains. Let Africa's daughters feel the grateful ties which bind them to reward their patron's care. By striving to obtain the noble prize of praise on earth and heaven's bright crown to wear. New York African Free School, April 5th, 1803, Mary Emmiston. Emmiston meditati meditatively stitched this verse with silk thread into a linen ground over the course of several days. The verse clearly exhibits her Christian faith and willingness to forgive her belief in emancipation for all enslaved, her gratefulness to her benefactors, and her stated and proud association with other daughters of Africa. Over, overall, this represents Mary Emerson's needlework and educational accomplishments. While it also negates the racist theories many in white society held that black children and people in general were incapable of learning or of being kind or sentimental, therefore not worthy of the time or funding to educate them. However, the New York Manumission Society thought otherwise. The New York African Free School was established in 1787 by the New York Manumission Society as an institution to educate enslaved and free black children in the city to be prepared for adulthood as free US citizens and ed educationally on par with their white counterparts. There has been excellent research done on the New York African Free School evidenced in two digital exhibits by the Color Conventions Project and the New, New York Historical Society. Black girls would have also learned needlework skills through, through the creation of clothing, hats, household linens, and quilts, such as these two by Phyllis Biggs. According to Kim, Kimberly Ray Connor in her book, Conversions and Visions in the Writings of African American Women, Phyllis Biggs was brought to the United States from her native land of Congo in 1818 at the age of 12 or 13 years old during her girlhood. On one of her quilts, she stitched, on one of her quilts stitched after her arrival, bears the inscription, they stripped me of everything but my thoughts. But one day I balled up my fist and held up both my arms. With my left arm, I held my freedom to think and with and my freedom to pray. With my right arm, I held on to my religion, my art, and my music. That quote truly spoke to me when I first read it last year. Despite all of her circumstances, and it is apparent that it took some time, but how resolute and self-assured Phyllis Biggs was to inscribe that on her quilt, which has been passed down through her family. For my dissertation, I plan to conduct genealogical research for Phyllis Biggs and have so far found that her great-great-grandson, Alfonso Biggs' collection is now at Columbus State U University in Georgia. I hope to be able to visit the school in person, to visit the archives, depending on COVID protocols, and look through the contents of his co collection, which includes, I believe, two boxes of five quilts from his family, including ones from Phyllis Biggs. Crochet is another needlework skill passed down through the generation of Black girls and mothers in the US. Crochet is used to dress this doll in the Mosley collection. She is an African-American plastic female child doll with swivel limbs, sleeping eyes, and black artificial hair. The doll is wearing a pink crochet dress 
and bonnet with white accents and white plastic shoes. She stands 13 inches high, dated between 1990 and 2000, and stamped made in China. Her attire is evidence of another type of needlework skill learned by Black girls and mothers that was used to create clothing and household items over the centuries. And crochet is a needlework skill that I still have to do research about um, in, into the history of, but it is a skill that was passed down through my own family. And this style dressed in pink and, pink and white accented dress and bonnet reminds me of my grandmother and the many crochet items I saw around her house as a child. One in particular that I remember is this blue and white crochet toilet paper cover in the form of a skirt of a dress for a black Barbie doll torso. I believe that the Barbie, that the Barbie doll also donned a crochet hat similar to the one depicted here. It sat on the tank of the toilet in the second floor bathroom. I can still picture it now. My grand grandmother learned to crochet, sew, quilt from my great grandmother, Nana. Nana taught her, who taught my mother, who taught me. I still possess a crochet quilt started by my great grandmother, Nana, and finished by my mother, then given to me as a child. Conducting ge genealogical research, I have learned that needlework skills date back to at least my great great aunt Anne Eliza Murray in Philadelphia, who was a dressmaker in the second half of the 1800s. In my family and in many black American families, needlework was a skill girls, girls learned to make a living, to clothe herself and her family, to create quilts and blankets to warm a bed at night, to exhibit educational accomplishments, accomplishments to be framed and hung on walls of homes, and in general to decorate one's home. Each piece possibly done in some way, as Alice Walker would say, to feed her soul and to order the universe in her personal concept of beauty. And just to end this section, I thought it would be um, fun to take a few minutes before I turn, turn it over to Molly and to invite you all to share with us if you have any experiences with needlework. Do any of you, um, did any of you grow up learning any type of needlework? And if so, what, what kind was it? And is it a skill that you still use today? And feel free again to unmute yourself and share. I'd love to hear what your exper exper experiences have been. Um, so I'll go ahead and share. I personally don't have any experience with uh, crochet, uh, embroidery or crocheting, but my mother does. And she uh, has crocheted um, blankets for me and my uh, siblings. And so, and so that's it. So it really was uh, I'm like, wow, yes, like, I, you know, that's in my family as well. So I personally do not know how to crochet, but. Um, well, you I, still have time to learn. Just like I'm still learning the corner, <laughs> you have time to learn crochet. Yes, I do. And all you need is exactly. one needle. Exactly. <laughs> Anyone else? Can you all hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Um, I grew up also, also um, well, actually learning crochet. Um, I went to a local boys and girls club oh. and actually a cousin, an older cousin of mine worked there and she taught all of my siblings how to crochet. Mm -hmm. At one point, my grandmother also used to knit and she taught my sister and I how to knit. Mm -hmm. And to this day, like I don't do any needlework. My sister sometimes sews, but my brother, this is like the interesting part. My brother really um, mastered the craft of sewing, crocheting, um, any type of needlework. So now he actually creates his, he has a doll line. Oh. Um, like very um, African centered, similar to how you were speaking about. Um, and he is producing them on a large scale now. So this is like, I, I text him literally just now when we were talking about this, like, wow, you need to be on this. Like, this is just awesome. Yes, if, if you don't mind sharing the name of his line, I'd love to look it up. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. I could definitely put it in the chat for you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, good evening. Can you hear me okay? 
Yes, we can hear you. Hi, thank you. Uh, I personally, my mom showed me cross-stitch. Um, I, I think she taught me how to crochet. I'm now teaching my daughter, her granddaughter, how to knit and do crochet. And um, watching the two of them is interesting, a little bit of frustration, but my daughter's eight, mom is 78. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I find myself now, I, I sew, and I, my daughter watched this, there's a blog called My my Foggy Stuff, and it's a African-American woman, I think, and her daughter, and she does, like, these Barbie creations of, like, clothing and sets and all kinds of hand, like, DIY type of things. From my daughter watching those YouTube blogs, I started sewing Barbie clothes for her dolls. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now she doesn't even watch them anymore, and now I'm still watching the blogs, but... I, she has, like, a, the perfect custom sweatsuits and everything, you know, wow. I use my Cricut, I use my Cricut to kind of customize and make little miniature versions of what she has. That is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And, and what is the name of the blog? It's called My Foggy Stuff. My Foggy Stuff. Okay, I'm ready. It's very yeah. cool. Like, it's <laughs> I, I will check it out. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone okay. else want to share? My mother was a knitter. She knit us sweaters and um, all hats and all kinds of things growing up. And when I was about six, she taught me to to knit just granny squares. And I used to do it and sew them together and try to make things for my dolls. Mm -hmm. um, and I stopped. And when I was in college, I tried to take it up again. And for some reason, I just couldn't do it. it was, um, I, you think you wouldn't lose that, but I did. And um, but, but you still have time to learn. Well, I don't know, <laughs> but I did take a crocheting course after that when my when I was home on maternity leave with my daughter and mm -hmm. made her a vet, crocheted her a vest. So oh, that's nice to have that. That's nice. Thank you for sharing, Kelly. Um, if I may, I I don't know if I told you this, but like one of the first days of school that my son came home from preschool this year, he had um, they were sewing buttons on pieces of fabric. To work on like their precision and their dexterity so i just want to let you know that needlework is alive and well yes i love in, ba it. in baltimore city schools I, yes that that's actually i i remember when i was in home ec i'm dating myself philadelphia many many years ago back during the 90s that was one thing that we had to learn as well in home home ec class how to sew on buttons and do you know very simple things just so you would know how to mend clothes pretty much Anyone else? I'll take one more person. I was taught uh, crocheting and I learned knitting somewhere else, but my um, maternal grandmother formerly was uh, educated up to third grade. She was a master seamstress. And when my father bought me a doll when I was about 10, she did an ensemble for my doll which I mm -hmm. thought was gorgeous. I didn't have an ensemble myself at that time, but <laughs> she had a, a, made a lovely coat for the doll and a dress. And I entered, um, I was very proud to enter the doll and the doll contest mm -hmm. in our area, so. That's amazing, very cool. Do, do you still have the doll? That's another story, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. If someone else is enjoying it, or <laughs> yeah, it was re it was recycled. Oh, okay, it, it happened that I asked for about it the day after it had gone in the recycle bin. It stayed mm -hmm. in my parents' house for years, but mm -hmm. lost to that one. Mm -hmm. It's it's all right. It was loved while it was here. Oh yes, very much so. <laughs> All right, now I will turn it over to Molly. Thank you all for sharing. Okay, and thank you, Kelly. Um, I hope you all um, save all those stories about being given a doll and your doll stories because I want to hear about them um, after I'm done here. Um, so I'm going to actually begin with a quick artifact that I think really ties in um, my research and in Kelly's research. And unfortunately, it's not at the Delaware Historical Society. But again, I do think it connects our work. Um, many of you might have seen this um, artifact, but this is called Ashley Sack. 
And um, I chose this selection um, because it's something that it struck, it struck me and it's, it's struck a lot of people. Um, if you were one of the first viewers at the National Museum of African American um, History and Culture um, in Washington, D.C., because it, it was an artifact that was included on their, on their oh first floor. Um, so this, um, I'll, I'll just read the embroidery on this back quickly. Um, it says, my great grandmother Rose, mother of Ashley gave her this sack when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina. It held a tattered dress, three handfuls of pecans, a braid of Rose's hair, told her it would it be filled with my love always. She never saw her again. Ashley is my grandmother, Ruth Middleton, 1921. So again, I chose this object um, as a segue because I wanted to show how materiality relates, uh, how Ashley's mother documented their, their separation herself, but she also took it as an opportunity to document the love that they had for each other, right? And, and the, the love that she had for her daughter. Um, and I really want us to you know, start thinking about not just this object, but the dolls and all of the objects, right? Um, as they're not really objects always that tell us these horror stories, right? Or again, uh, something that tells us about the daily instances or the iterations of being separated from our loved ones. But actually thinking about it as uh, Black folks documenting their lives every single day when they weren't even allowed, right, to have property themselves. And they weren't necessarily allowed to keep things private for themselves, right? And a lot, of, uh, a lot of scholars argue that the domestic space, especially on a plantation, was very hard to maintain for people who were enslaved, right? Because at any moment, someone could come into your home. But I wonder also, right, what was Ashley uh, feeling every time she saw this, right? What lengths did she have to go through to keep it safe throughout her entire life, right? Seeing it as a, a, it was a flower sack that someone could have easily thrown away or recycled, but she kept it with her and she didn't just keep a piece of it, right? She didn't keep it, she didn't cut it up so it would be smaller and she could hide it maybe like in her bosom, but she kept the entire sack. And imagine her telling um, all of her children about it and their children telling their children so, so much that um, her granddaughter one day could uh, identify the object when she went to a flea market in South Carolina. That's amazing. So oh as, Kelly, as Kelly mentioned, um, needlework and making uh, our own practice of documenting our everyday lives is actually a much bigger in intervention into what it means for Black people to interact with objects, right, that are often seen as unwanted uh, neglected or used for a purpose other than what it was originally designed. And I'm always, I was really struck too with um, Mary Emerson's, um, sorry, I'm distracted. I just heard a baby head go bonk on the floor. Um, <laughs> Mary, Emis, Mary Emerson's, um, um, her needlework, right? Because we can also imagine that maybe in, in a free, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Kelly, but in a African free school, right? They were using recycled materials often to practice on, or perhaps they were using um, materials that people donated from home for them to practice their needle work on, right? Um, and in this sense, we can also see the lengths that black folks went to undertake their own archival practice again. So I really want us to think about how textual evidence, again, not just something that we see in a museum, like uh, again, a bill of sale or um, uh, um, uh, a monument or um, a piece of paper, especially when we're talking about black folks who are unable to read, right? Um, we don't really use those objects to document our grief, right? Our grief is often unseen in the archive and is therefore unfought in the archive, right? kind of dehumanizing us, not as people, we didn't experience loss, right? Because there was nothing for us to lose. We didn't experience joy because there was nothing for us to be happy about. These objects actually tell a completely different story, right? And so there's this fact. We can imagine from this fact, for instance, that maybe pecans were Ashley's favorite food and only her mother would know something like that, right? Or maybe they practiced braiding each other's hair and that was a sacred 
practice for them, right? And so she left a, a, a braid of her own hair for her daughter to remember her by. And so materiality, right, or objects that we can touch and we can feel um, really um, are important to Black studies and just Black history in general, right? Just as much as kind of the imagination or speculating as to what might have happened to our ancestors. We can think of, again, the, the chain gang, right? Or we can think of the, the chains that kept people together and apart at the same time, or the brush of cotton, right? Which is um, soft to us when we get it from the store now, but we know was actually very rough on people's skin when they were picking it, never mind the needle, right? Or the pin on a, um, on a, a, cotton, uh, a cotton plant stock. Um, and so in, in this sense, right, materiality, it can be something that we use to document and we, we spread joy or told secrets of, right? Again, thinking of the sack, but it's also something that can really give us um, a language of, of a permanency. So that, again, even if it shows up in a, a flea market, other folks could have walked by this object, right? But a very special someone could have asked to buy it or it would have been priceless to them, right? Because of their own uh, connection to that object. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with the first doll here because I, Kelly mentioned something really interesting um, before, was, which was um, talking about the ways that dolls can actually kind of teach us about ourselves thinking about how dolls or material can also teach other people what we wanted them to know about ourselves, right? So we're gonna do a short kind of visual analysis with this doll and we're gonna, going to read it as a text together. So you can unmute yourself and just shout out, what, what do you see here? What is unique about this doll? What is this doll wearing? What is this doll holding? The texture um, in the dress, as well mm -hmm. as the baby's um, clothing that she's holding, which you actually, I guess for me, maybe because I'm a little blonde, but I didn't see the baby at first until you said what she's holding. Great. What does she have around her waist? Apron. Looks like an apron. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she has and her head wrapped. I was just going to say that. Yeah, exactly. She has her head wrapped, right? So between the head wrap and the apron, this all we can imagine she was in a hot kitchen, right? Right. So this is what we, we this is what we call a mammy doll, right? How who's heard this term? What is a mammy? Does someone want to think about it for us or kind of shout out words that you have heard associated with this term? Mainly, I think of servants. Somebody who's mm -hmm. like serving in the house, maybe. Exactly. Active. Um, mm -hmm. I would also point out she has something covering her legs. Yeah, that's a great point. She's very modest, right? Yes. Has anyone seen um, To Kill a Mockingbird? Have you read that? Who is Calpurnia in that story? She's the maid. She's the maid, but she really takes the role of the mother too, right? She raises those children when Atticus is not around or someone um, in Gone with the Wind, right? These are kind of dated, a little bit of dated examples, but I wanted to show that there's a long instance, right, of dolls Mammy dolls, and also just dolls that were meant for young girls that also inscribe notions of what it meant to be, grow up to be a Black woman, as well as a Black mother or a Black mammy, right? So Patricia Hill Collins writes that um, Black mammies were w women who worked. They were stereotyped as very mean, right? They were very hard. They had little empathy. They were the ones that delivered the discipline, right? They're always the ones that gave out the spanking. Um, often they were big bodied, um, emotionless. Um, they didn't have part romantic partners, right? So we never see Calpurnia, right? Ever having a husband or her own children. But again, dogs really taught, teach people 
Um, and it teaches young folk um, when, to play, uh, to stage sociality, right? Or to stage relationships. If you've ever watched a child play, they create conversations between them, right? But psychologists will tell us that both of those, those conversations are actually conversations between the people that the child is embodying in that moment, right? So for instance, have you heard of the doll test? Has anyone heard of the doll test? Yes. Yeah, so in, 19, in the 1940s, there were two doctors named Mamie and Kenneth Clark. Um, and this test uh, took a, a sampling of young black children in the South and um, they had children play with black dolls and white dolls. And they asked them very basic questions like, which doll is good and which doll is bad? Which doll is pretty and which doll is ugly, right? And so we can see that in the test, right? And in some of the video and some of the written testimony from the doll test, a lot of these black children, right? Would use uh, racial epithets, right? On the black doll because they had heard of that out in the real world. They had started calling the black dolls ugly. And even and if the doctors asked them, well, which one looks like you? Almost 100% of the time they would say they look like the white doll, right? And that's not because they can't see or they don't know what they look like. It was because they identified virtue and goodness, right, with the white doll. So dolls teach us similar things about social roles, like what it means to be a good mother or what it means to be a caretaker. Before you, oh, go ahead. Uh, I think it's important to point out there that if they were uh, in formal education at that point, whether it was a kindergartner group, age group, they had seen enough television magazines and other media uh, forms present to them the stereotypes that they then learn, act upon, and repeat. Exactly. And now, if we were to do this test, we probably wouldn't do so much adult tests, right? We could do like a screen test, or we could show children characters that they identified with. But thinking pre-media, right, dolls kind of being this main mode of role play for children, I think you're exactly right. It was kind of this precursor to how children began to kind of project their own being onto other materials. Um, so we can also think, right, again, going back to thinking about what does this doll teach us about caretaking? If you're a little girl and you all of your, and you have mammy dolls, so, this, so uh, full disclosure, right, I have a white grandmother. I grew up as a young black girl seeing my grandmother's mammy doll collection. Why would my grandmother collect these dolls, right? But as I got older, right, but we can bracket that as a whole other conversation, but we, can, but we can also think, I'm seeing these dolls, and I'm thinking, oh, well, I, when I grow up, I, I have babies, right? It is my job to have babies. Uh, she wears an apron. She looks like me, so I will, then I should learn to cook, right? So it's kind of describing these social roles for young girls. Um, but also, we should also think about the ways that mammies kind of, um, again, align with uh, racist tropes, right? So very much mammy can be, be seen as a racist slur now. Um, the term is also kind of used on people who um, do, if you in social media circles, a mammy kind of is someone who does a lot of emotional labor for other people, especially white folks, um, without having any type of payback or any type of um, reciprocation, I guess you could say. Um, just want to make sure I have all my notes here. Um, but I also don't want us to just think about kind of these bad stereotypes. I want to think about also how dolls can show us that, it, or the Mosley collection and some of these dolls actually kind of um, disrupt the idea of some um, so, uh, stereotypes, especially for Black women and mothers during enslavement, right? Could so, you go back for a minute to the last slide? Yeah, go ahead. Mammy as reproductive violence. What are you saying there? Yeah, so we can really think about um, mammies as people who were taken into the home. I think that was you or someone else had mentioned that they usually work in the home, right? So if someone's working in the home, where are they not? They're not with their own children, right? So really thinking about people who are forcibly taken from their children, right? And maybe forced to breastfeed other people's children. Mm -hmm as disrupting their own reproductive choice, right? Okay. So I cannot choose to have a child on my own because I'm taking care of someone else's child. Okay, thank and, you. 
You're welcome. And um, another scholar that you might want to look up if you're interested in that, um, that Kelly mentioned is Sadia Hartman, because she also writes about the emotional labor that Black women did um, working even in the 1920s, like as indentured servants, raising other people's children six days of the week, so that when they went home to their own families on that seventh day, they didn't have time to play with their kids, right? Because they were so tired. They couldn't emotionally take on care for their partners or for their children. And it intervened with their own lives and their own ability to care. So thank you for pointing that out. So Angela Davis, right, thinking about the, uh, the uh, activist, but also the historian, Angela Davis, um, she really writes about how uh, we have these ideas that Black women simply uh, stayed in the house and that we took care of children. Um, but actually this doll, right, I love this doll because this doll is showing us that Black women actually um, tended to work in the house, right, as Angela Davis writes about one account. They worked in, she worked in the house, a woman would work in the house from 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. But if the work was not done in the field at 8 p.m., she went out and she had to help them, right, until the work was done, or 11 p.m., which everyone came sooner, right? That's what she writes. And so often when we, again, thinking about gendered labor, men in the field, women inside the house, or even how we reproduce that now in our own kind of social roles, right? Men go out and work, women stay home and take care of children. Anyone who's a working mother now will tell you, actually mothers do it all, right? So we're not just in the house taking care of the children, but just because when our day ends or someone else's day ends, then we must take on the, the, the other work, right? Um, this doll also, I just wanted to show, Kelly and I were kind of laughing about this doll because it looked like she was wearing sunglasses, but now I see in this high res, uh, this high res image that she's not wearing sunglasses. Um, but, <laughs> um, but I love this because it looks like she is wearing um, self-made clothes, right? And that Black women show care for themselves, just like the sack, just like Ashley Sack, right? By taking care of their own clothes and making their own clothes. Often they were shreds of, te um, of textiles that were sometimes left over from maybe even a flower sack or a burlap, sa burlap sack. And so um, there's many historians and scholars who write about sartor the sartorial choices of Black women on plantations or right after enslavement. But I like that this doll kind of playfully reminds us that, um, they, that Black women took care of their bodies Right? even when they were in a system that didn't want them to. And they also took care of what they wanted it to look like if they absolutely could, right? And I also like to, just to be playful again, right? She's holding her, her uh, basket above her head. Like, she's like, I cannot get this dirty, right? This perfectly matching outfit. Um, but, uh, so I think that's all I have that I wanna cover, um, Kelly. But I wanted to, we can end with um, a couple questions um, that I have kind of like Kelly's questions, right? So did a mother or a mother figure give you a doll? And what do you remember about this doll, right? What does this doll teach you about yourself or about your family? Or I put another way, what other things did dolls teach you in terms of history? If you're familiar with the Mosley collection, she has different dolls that kind of show us different historical moments. Is there anything of dolls that you have that taught you things like that? Hi, um, this is Kathy. Uh, I have to say, I, I wish I did have kind of more of that kind of experience and instead it was the opposite of, I don't know that I ever had a black doll growing up. Um, I'm 47, born in 1974, just to give context. Um, it was, you know, the Barbies, et cetera, but we've never had a black doll. And so of course with my daughter, I mentioned before she's eight, um, that was all I would buy her. Purposely just to, again, set a tone for her, set a standard for her. Um, and then, you know, when she would ask, well, can I have what she calls tan? Can I have a tan doll? I say, oh, well, sure you can. You know, we'll get one of those, you know, and kind of wanted to make it the exception to re make her realize, you know, see an image of yourself. And, um, you know, of course, talking about something highly manufactured like a Barbie, like they, they're, the variety is incredible now of what they've done. Obviously, it's marketing and capitalism, but, you know, recognize that the dollar counts. Um, so it's it's just nice to see to see these these artifacts, what are now artifacts, what was somebody once somebody's toy, um, 
makes me want to maybe make some homemade things for her instead of just the manufactured pieces. If I could add, um, I'd mention that I grew up uh, having like Bratz dolls. Um, so this is like the 2000s, yeah. Um, I also had Cabbage Patch dolls. Uh, my aunt is like a huge collector of those. So she made sure like my siblings and I also had some. Um, and then like the American Girl doll series, which I only really liked the there was like a black one I think her name was Abby maybe yeah I'm not sure I think it was Addie with oh Addie. Addie, Addie. yeah mm -hmm. something like that yeah um I remember reading her book like there was just like the series along with it um and that kind of ties into your question about like in terms of history I think that dolls like what they teach me but also just putting in the context of history like it shows you the childhood and the um, adolescent like that existed, especially amongst Black children, because that is something we, again, in the archives, you don't see. Um, in the media, it's really not, it's just not like <laughs> visible. Basically, you have to search for it and look for it. But with something so simple as dolls and this like material item, you really can envision the uh, the adolescents amongst these black individuals, yeah. No, if I can just add something to that. Um, I grew up with an Addie doll too. And that, that was something I remembered. Um, I mean, obviously I was very, very young. And so I remember thinking that that was the first time I had seen, I didn't, I didn't know that black kids were enslaved, right? So. When we often think of slaves or as we're taught like the enslaved in school, we see pictures of adults, but I hadn't imagined that I think Addie had like a younger sister too. And I hadn't imagined that there could be a baby that was enslaved. Um, but also Addie was their only black doll. And of course she had to be an enslaved person, right? There was no other black person from any other era to teach us what, you know, as if like we only had a history of being enslaved. Mm. Does anyone have any other dolls that someone had given them that was special? Yeah, too. I did have Barbie dolls growing up, mixed black and white. And what I remember of the black ones, and, and I had a black walk, walking doll that was my mother's. So made in the probably 1950s that I still, still have. She gave it to me and I still have it. Um, but the one thing that I remember about all the black dolls that I did have was their hair was different from mine. And that's like a whole other topic. But growing up and having these black dolls with this, you, you know, straight hair, that was nothing like mine. And having to go through that whole process of eventually of hating my hair and then growing to love my hair as it is. Did your, did your doll ever prompt you to have conversations with your mother or anyone at home about your hair? Or did they use the doll to teach you about hair at all? Not that I recall as a girl, no. I mean, knowing my mom, she may have, but I mean, being, being, <laughs> being that that was so many years ago, I, I don't recall any. No, good question. Okay, so we are actually going to go into a bit of a, um, a group activity. And I know some of you are um, calling in. Um, oh, um, Jesse Erickson said, my mother collected dolls, mostly Barbie dolls and Cabbage Patch Kids. And she made it a point to collect black dolls. She also gave me numerous dolls as a child, including a Diana Ross and Michael Jackson doll. Oh yeah, so she was teaching you about music. That's exactly what it is, right? <laughs> Even if you won't listen to my music, maybe you did or you didn't want to, right? You were going to know the great. Dolls can be incredible teaching tools. Um, so we'll go into our group activity. And again, I know some of you are on um, phones or you might be in the car as Zoom allows us to do now, which is great. Um, so if you're able, um, is it possible that um, either Kobe or Dr. Lampkin could put in a link to the collection? 
in the chat box. And we're just going to pick out a doll that either speaks to you. You could find a doll that you might have looked like you had that doll. Um, and we'll talk about why the doll is important and we'll kind of connect it to some of the themes that we've talked about today. It's not necessarily an assignment. There's no right or wrong answers. We just kind of want to facilitate a group activity with, with the collection itself since we can't all kind of physically be around them and, and see them. Thank you. And just give us one second here. No worries. In the meantime, if there's anyone that has any questions for me or Kelly about anything that we've spoken about, feel free to just shout it out or put it in the chat. Thank you. And if you have trouble with that link, please let me know. The link is working for me. I can only speak for myself. Great, thank you. So I'll just, while you all are looking at the dolls, people are chiming in the chat. And if it's okay with you, Kelly, I can just read um, from the chat what people are saying. Um, so um, Carmen Shepard wrote to everyone, I learned how to sew basic things in home economics class. My mother was an excellent seamstress. My mom made my wedding dress and all of the bridesmaid dresses, very impressive. Um, we were gifted with a sewing machine from my dad when we were younger, hoping to keep our interest in making it easier for my mom to teach us. While my interest faded, I of my three sisters, uh, one of my three sisters still sews. My younger sister crochets. I wear what both sisters create and I love their designs. I love it. That is awesome. It's funny, my, um, so my grandmother taught see my mother and her four sisters to sew as well and they had sewing machines growing up and I was just I hadn't really uh, been in touch with one of, one of my cousins but um, being that I got engaged I was talking to her and she was telling me about how she um, went to a secondhand store and found her wedding dress and then my aunt um, basically change this wedding dress all around to make it perfect for my cut for my cousin's wedding so she 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 also like like your mother had that skill to be able to make a wedding dress for for her daughter which I think is a wonderful gift to give um, when when you have such a skill it's amazing Does anyone see a doll from the um, from the collection that surprises them? Or is there something that you've never seen before? I just typed in the chat um, which doll is my favorite. Um, it's not like it's I've never seen it before, but I think that it's very uh, unique in terms of the hair. So if you look at if you guys are on the link, it's the doll with the pink, the checkered shirt, and the multiple like braided ponytails. Um, I think that's super cool. I always like looking at, I think it's also like, like when you think of little girls, like during like the early like 19th and 20th century, maybe like they had hairstyles like that. Um, I'm also thinking about, this is very current, but like the show Lovecraft, Country, county, country, yeah. Um, there was a episode with the like Bopsy and Topsy image, imagery, um, which is from the book, like Uncle Tom's Cabin, I believe. So that hairstyle has kind of been like vilified a little bit. Like people are often maybe scared of that or especially like black people, like that image of it, it, it maybe it's like a horror to them. But I think this is showing the beauty of it and really accepting it and like, you know, yeah, showing the beauty in it. Hi, 
I agree. I see how long it would have it would take to do someone's hair like that, right? Just as we now will sit for four or five hours to get box braids or something, right? That could have taken the same amount of time to do someone's hair like that. Ms. Collins, I, I like this. The image that's on screen now is one of the ones I picked up because it it represents a doll that I had when I was younger. Um, different outfit, but it has kind of similar look, facial features and look about it. My doll had a, I don't know if this one has, it was cloth body with more uh, plastic arms and legs, but um, actually to this day, it's, it's a little tattered now, but I still have it. Um, from when I was young. And then there's another one with the crocheted outfit on, which reminds me of my mom who loved to crochet. So it made me think about if, you know, her ability to make those kinds of, not only doll outfits, but adult outfits, you know, and different blankets and things that she would do. Do you mind if I ask, do you know, have you ever talked to the person who gave you that doll about how they got it or why they got it for you or know kind of the history of getting the doll for you? Um, I don't recall that conversation. I just remember having it and, you know, it wasn't till I was older that it, it was one of those things like as you purge through things as you get older, it's like, oh, I think I want to keep this one. You know, there was just something about it that you know, it had some connection to being young and the family and having this doll at, you know, th at this point, I'm 55, 56 years old, it's still here. <laughs> so, you know, it, there's a, some sentimental piece to it that, want, that I want to keep it. Were these, like I'm looking at the, at the doll um, that represents um, Addie Mae Collins and there's some others of other dolls of the ones that um, were killed in the, the bombing at 16th Baptist Church. Were those commercial dolls? It said made in China. So that's actually a really great question because um, I almost wonder if um, like the doll itself might be a commercial doll, but then how it's clothed and the sign that was created for the doll is kind of what gives it this, captures the story about the, I almost wonder if they were instructional. Mm -hmm. And it's one of Henry Box Brown too. Yeah, Just like, like that wouldn't none of those would be sort of a commercial thing you would put out. So you think maybe exactly. they bought the doll and then designed it themselves for. What That's they what I'm make. thinking. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah. So to add to um, this discussion, yeah, um, uh, Brenda Mosley did a lot of of sewing and, and designing the clothes for okay. the dolls okay. that you see. A lot of the dolls that you see in the, in the in her in her collection, um, she so the dolls themselves um, might have been co commercially bought, like actually made in like if it said you know made in China or made in Mexico. But for some of the dolls, she actually you know designed the clothes and clothed them. Okay. Okay. So speaking of her design, what do people think of some of these dolls that um, are representative of Malcolm X or Betty Shabazz or Medgar Evers? And those are on the third page. Mm -hmm. Not there yet. I think the likeness is off. Do you want to say more? Uh, 
excuse me? Oh, um, someone said that the likeness is off and I was just curious if they wanted to say more about that. So like if you were to change that doll or how, if you would have styled it differently or what do you think could have been added to make them look different? Or do you think that dolls aren't the best vehicle to tell some of these stories? Can I can I ask in the link be put in the chat again? I I was driving and I think I lost the connection there. No worries. The the link to the for the gallery. Oh, <laughs> that's not it. Kobe might have to do it. You know, I see it from from uh, Jesse Erickson's post. There. Oh, thank you. Thank, thanks again. I can respond to your question about um, if dolls are the right piece of material to tell these types of stories. Um, it's just, I feel like a form of uh, uh, of media, like or a form of material culture. So for instance, like there were quilts that told stories in the past and present, um, which is equivalent to if there was a, a poem or a uh, monograph or anything like that, it's just another type. Um, I think dolls have the same impact as well. You just maybe have to read in or like look in a little bit more than you would something like a poem or, you know, a text where it's right there in your face. Um, they tell stories and yeah. I do have to ask about um, the series of the baby dolls with the, looks like the chain gang outfits on. Do we know? what that's all about. <laughs> I've never seen this before. Oh, it says meant to represent a chain gang in the Underground Railroad of the Basement Museum. Okay. I'm looking at the description now. Um, yes, yeah, so originally um, these dolls were in, um, were housed in the basement of Trinity Mosley and on display in her museum. And so she ordered her dolls thematically and chronologically. And so with that, she wanted to really, she wanted to show a holistic experience of African-Americans from Africa to present. And okay. so, and so what she did was, um, she really tried to order it chronologically and thematically. So from, so from, uh, from Africa to going towards, you know, to enslavement and then what's happening during enslavement and trying to represent that with these dolls for, um, and so she would um, then, you know, create, you know, the scenarios and in different scenes depicting um, these happenings his, that happened historically to black people. Okay, thank you. I I also wanted to note that Jesse that Jesse Erickson men mentions that the doll that he includes in his link looks like it's from an earlier period, fashion wise, and he, that he is surprised to see such a wide range, a, chron a chronological range in the um, selection of dolls that are included here. And the link that he includes is of a small African-American Buckeye doll, it's called, with a corn cob body and a chestnut head. And the arms are made from black pipe cleaners and the hair is black yarn, um, which is 
very different from some of the other dolls that we have spoken about already, such as the Chang Gang group. And um, the one baby doll that someone mentioned earlier that they had one similar to as a child, um, trying to find it again, I believe it's on the first page, that we have pictured in our presentation as well. This one says that it is a doll with a stuffed cloth, cloth body and a bisque porcelain head and limbs. Did anyone else want to share what they found interesting about the collection? Or, or did you have any other questions for Molly and I about our presentations in general? Um, I don't have a question, but more of a um, comment. Um, or So uh, Brenda uh, B mostly does have a book. Um, uh, it's, um, we unfortunately don't have it for sale at our museum store yet, but it's uh, called She's a Doll, uh, The Vision, The Mission. And so I can uh, link it to link it to you guys in a follow-up email um, after this presentation, because um, I don't have it on me right now, but uh, I don't have a link on me right now, but uh, this is a really good, uh, it, it goes, and this book really goes in depth on how, on really what, what inspired uh, Brenda to start the collection her, 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 the thought process behind it and, and really her philosophy for creating, for creating uh, the, the museum uh, in her basement and that, and now part of that collect, that museum and collection is at the Mitchell Center. And so I'd uh, highly recommend this, giving this book a read. So, um, and I'll definitely link that to you all in a follow-up email. Um, I, come, oh, sorry. I was just going to say the book is also on Amazon. I had looked it up earlier. Yes, that's where I got my copy. <laughs> okay, I have a question um, for both you, Molly and Kelly. So um, I am a uh, PhD student currently in the history department at Syracuse University. And I'm just in my preliminary stages of my dissertation, but my topic is girlhood, black girlhood. Um, and I just wanted to ask you both like your techniques and like the ways that you've looked through the archives and, you know, found these sources. Like, could you speak more on that if possible? And how you incorporate it into your, you know, overall research topic. Did you want to go first, Molly? Um, sure. So um, I am um, traditionally, right, I'm an English scholar, so I'm a scholar of literature. And so um, I've always been interested, as you can kind of see through what I've talked about today, in what we usually don't see as archives and what we see as maybe fictional as kind of a source of knowledge, right? So thinking more um, novels, not as um, a place for one to um, show us the range of their imagination, but instead to show us the range of their own personal memory of their, their own life. Um, and so I have a little bit of a different orientation um, to kind of my archival work in that I'm kind of part of my work and my argument is positioning more fictional, what is seen as fictional work as archive, archival documentation. Thinking about how going to the library is just as much an archival uh, practice as going to a museum, right? Or going to the Library of Congress, right? Versus going to the library down your street. But I also do a lot of traditional archival work where um, I did um, special collections work in Atlanta, at the Atlanta University Research Center, which is something you might wanna look into um, because they have a partnership with Spelman College Archives and they have a very generous travel award program for graduate students. And so I was on that fellowship one summer in Atlanta 
Um, and then I also did archival research at the, uh, the Smithsonian for African American Culture and History. Um, but the, I think that they have one of the most sophisticated online databases. And so I was able to do a lot of my work um, online. Um, but as Kelly mentioned, you know, we're often looking for things that don't exist or don't, I should say, aren't represented in ways that we would think, right? So again, I'm looking, typing in black, you know, black plus motherhood plus uh, 1800 some doesn't come up. I didn't come up with anything, right? I had to look for bill, bill of sale, or I had to look um, woman, Negro woman and child, Negro wench and child, um, missing child sometimes to find what I was looking for. And so I think sometimes it's about kind of retooling or leaning into some of the violence of the archive or leaning into some of these violent um, tropes or narratives or terms that you're looking for in order to kind of um, exercise out of or breathe into it the stories that you are looking for. And then of course, sometimes having a personal moment as a researcher and finding that you might be forcing a narrative or forcing something and trying to look for something that um, either A, there's not documentation for, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen and that didn't mean that it didn't exist. So I think that's kind of a practice that we all have to undertake as scholars, especially when we're thinking about the fraught history of gender and racialized violence. Thank you. Yeah, and I I came to history, history and um, my research from a, another career. I had have a degree in interior, interior design and historic preservation. So, um, I worked in an architecture firm for 10 years. And during my studies previously and while working, I um, was looking at the fact that when I went to museums his and historic sites, I often rarely saw any interior design, historic interiors or museum interpretation that was about people who look like me and like my family. And that led me to speak to my mentors and for them to um, tell me that, no, that that research doesn't exist. Um, at least at this point in time, I'm talking 10, 15 years ago now, that research doesn't exist um, as of yet at that point in time, when I started thinking about going back to school, they were just beginning to re reinterpret um, the cabins of enslaved people on different plantation sites. So I came back to school interested in what I saw as African-American material culture and historic interiors, because I wanted to be able to then go into the museum field to um, help people better interpret their, inter their, their historic sites to include the stories of people who look like me and people of color more, broad more broadly. That's become a very popular um, 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 thing, a very popular exercise to do, especially in, in, in the past year. Um, I came to this project in particular because I also love textiles, being an interior designer, learning about textiles and just being able to handle them was one of my favorite things to do in the world while I was working. So um, I learned about these samplers made by black schoolgirls that were just beginning to be purchased by museums and being recognized as something valuable in the early 20th century, 21st century. So in the early 2000s, museums were just really beginning to recognize them and scholars of samplers and needlework were, were beginning to write about these pieces. And uh, what I began to see is that if we centered these, we, we would learn more, more about Black girls of the 18th and 19th centuries, about the history of edu education for these for Black children and for Black girls, which is another topic which has not really received much attention, and um, more broadly about Black interiors, because I'm still interested in historic interiors, and in finding some of the or organizational records in the archives, I find where they have drawn up plans, architectural plans, or given descriptions in their um, 
meeting minutes and records about what these school rooms or these school, these school buildings look like. So um, I came at it from that, that point of view and just finding along the way, especially in my coursework years of my PhD, reading more literature about African-American history and African-American material culture and how people, how scholars who do this work are looking for the absences and where they can make the interventions. I, I started to pull together my project and decide that I would focus on needlework and fo focus on black girls and needlework to talk about um, our communities more broadly and with more detail. Thank you. Oh, um, Jesse Erickson has a question here. When did doll makers actively begin resisting the stereotypes found in mommy dolls, mammy dolls, with more diverse, inclusive, and or accurate representations of blackness? Was it early in this history or did it coincide with other later black liberation movements? Um, I would just, someone had mentioned, um, I'm sure Kobe has tons to say about this. Um, someone had mentioned um, earlier capitalism. And so um, I think that, you know, especially there's been waves of these dolls recently as of late, um, I, in the late 2000 aughts, in the early kind of like uh, 2009, 2010, right? There was like a line of Barbie dolls that included some Olymp like Serena Williams and Olympic dolls. Um, but obviously thinking much sooner than that, um, I, um, do also remember though, like my grandmother talking about black power dolls and I don't know what she was talking, I don't know what she's talking about. I've never been able to find them. Um, and so I, it definitely was not a bona fide Barbie doll. Um, uh, they definitely would not do something like that, but I do think that there must have been some sort of line of dolls, maybe like in the seventies with afros because my grandmother has talked about like afro dolls that she saw in magazines like Jet. Um, but I, I've never really seen anything to corroborate that. Um, go ahead, Kobe. So I, um, I just wanna preface this by saying I'm in, by no means an expert on um, the, the history of, of black doll making in the United States, but from, from the, uh, brief research I've done, um, I know that in the early 20th century is when you see doll, black doll manufacturers, um, people usually from formerly enslaved uh, peoples really, really try to create dolls that push back against stereotypes that you've, that, that you commonly see and Black dolls that are produced in in their in in that time, and so um, it's definitely I do know it's definitely something that is um, not a new phenomenon where we see black doll makers and manufacturers pushing back against stereotypes, um, but you know it's. Um, but it's definitely something that has, from from my limited research, I can see start starting from early nineteenth early early twentieth century, uh, late nineteenth centuries when you see black doll manufacturers starting to create um, more um, more positive representing dolls for black children. But definitely, I, I will want to follow up, follow up with you on that, so I can give you more, you know, meteor with references and, and dates and names. So, but so I'll definitely follow up with you on that. Does anyone have any more questions for me and Kelly before we have Dr. Lampkin close out for the evening?
All right. Well, first of all, thank you both for a spectacular program. And I want to thank everyone who is in attendance. And I just thought what the overview that you provided, as well as incorporating your own work and helping us kind of ask deeper questions about this collection here at the Delaware Historical Society went really well. It's a great way to kind of wrap up Women's History Month as well with this topic. So thank you both again tremendously and thank you all for participating and coming with great questions and very thoughtful responses and for sharing a bit of your own personal stories with us. Um, we appreciate hearing those. Um, we are wrapping this up um, we will be downloading this recording and we will be making it available to you uh, as well as sending you a link to an evaluation and we would appreciate your feedback on this program. Uh, it helps us give thought to future programs, uh, how we can make them uh, engaging and how we can continue to have audience engagement, especially uh, as we continue to do virtual programs. So you will receive that in an email from Kobe as a follow-up along with the link to Brenda Mosley's book for those of you who wanna do a deep dive into um, her life and her story, uh, which we certainly encourage you to do. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, we appreciate your time and we hope to see you again at future programs. So thank you. Yes, Bye. thank you.